Here we go. So tonight we are going to learn about a new data structure um, within Python. So this is a data structure. It's been around for a long time. Um, it's called a dictionary. And uh, they're, they're really critical to any application that you're going to write within Python. Um, at the end of class tonight, we're going to go over some, we're going to start really looking at real world uses of applications written in Python. And so a dictionary is going to be really helpful for uh, ingesting data that we may not know the structure of beforehand. Um, so if you're familiar with other programming languages, you'll have you know classes and you'll have strict definitions of what's in those classes. Um, but sometimes they struggle on how to handle data of unknown structure. And so a dictionary is going to help us work through that. Um, generally, they are a mapping structure. Uh, so if you've heard of key value pairs or hash maps or anything like that, um, a mapping structure always stores a value against a key. And so a Python dictionary uh, is, is a mapping structure like that. Um, the, the term or the actual data type in Python is a dict, D-I-C-T, which is short for dictionary. Um, they can store any value you want within them. So you can store uh, strings, numbers, objects, other dictionaries. <coughs> they're, they're kind of a generic, a generic structure that can hold anything. Um, frequently, they are used for um, handling multiple instances of the same type of thing. Like you could have multiple dictionaries in a list and each of those dictionaries represents a person. So all of those dictionaries would have a, a name attribute or a name key more accurately. Um, and so we can, we can start s storing things that look the same, but in this generic structure of a dictionary. Um, when, we, when we start looking at, at data analysis um, using things like pandas or numpy or whatever, uh, the dictionary concept is gonna feel really familiar because we're dealing with uh, data that we're not predefining what it looks like. So this is this is really a, a foundational thing that we're getting into that's gonna be used a lot in the Python programming language. Syntactically, um, to create a variable with a dictionary, uh, we, we make something that starts and ends with these brackets. So in this case, I'm making a, a variable called alien underscore zero and assigning a dictionary to it. Within that dictionary, I have a key. I have a couple keys and values in this one, but I have a key color, and it's associated with a value green with that colon. So if we, if we talk, how we would talk about this, we would say we have a dictionary. This one has two keys, color and points. Each of those as a value, so the, the value for the key color is, is green. The value for the key points is five. So you can immediately see that the, the values do not have to be the same, uh, the same data type, sorry, the same data type. We can store different data types within different values of, of a dictionary. Um, we can do a quick reference to get the values out of there with these, these brackets and the, the key, the string of the key. And so if we ran this code, it would print out aliens color is green, aliens point value is five. We'll get into that in more detail on different ways we can access data from a dictionary. Um, but for now, so dictionaries can store zero or more keys and their values. Keys must be hashable. So that's the thing within Python. Um, variables have to have this this hash attribute, and they are things you would typically think of strings and numbers, um, things that are immutable. So things that can't really change. And the value can be anything. So when I first made this slide, I thought, well, the keys can be anything, but that's not totally true. Or the keys can only be a string, but that's not true either. So typically, you will see your keys as strings and probably strings only. Uh, but know that they can be numbers. And we haven't talked about tuples yet, but they can be tuples as well. But you can't use a list 
as a key in a dictionary. The reason being is a list is not, um, a, a list can change. The things inside of a list can change. So it is a, a mutable data structure. Mutable meaning it, it can change. But these data structures behind the scenes, they don't actually change. So to create a dictionary, uh, this is just two, two ways we can do it. Um, D equals open and close parentheses. We now have an empty dictionary assigned to the variable D. The next line, D equals left parenthesis, the key, colon, the value, right parenthesis. And if you have multiple keys and values you're defining at construction time, you just separate those by commas. But the key and the value are always uh, associated to each other with that colon. Any questions yet? Are y'all already familiar with map kind of constructs, hash maps and things like that? I know it's a Java term. I don't know what a C-sharp term is, but I'm sure it's similar. If you've done any JavaScript programming, um, this is very similar to like a JSON object, where it's just it's just a map. It's just a whole bunch of un, unstructured data. We can change things when they are in the dictionary. So line one, I'm creating a D variable with an empty dictionary. Then I'm assigning the value, going from right to left, I'm assigning the value 35 into the key age. So we use this syntax to, it's the same as almost getting the value, but we can also assign a value to it using this syntax saying, uh, this this reads as the, the uh, dictionary D, we want to set the key age to the value five, 35. Then another one, we can set the key colors to, in this case, a list. And that list has three strings in it. Um, so uh, using this, this interactive terminal again, uh, this is kind of what it looks like when we when we run through this code. So D equals age 35, or, or a, a dictionary with the key age and the value 35. Um, if I print out that D variable, it will show me, based on the parentheses that we have, I'm sorry, not parentheses, the uh, left bracket, uh, that we have a dictionary, a key age, and the value 35. If we had more, it would just be comma separated. We can remove a key and its corresponding value from a, diction from a dictionary using the DEL, the delete keyword. So when I then print out to that dictionary again, you can see it's gone back to an empty dictionary. Super fun yet? Everybody really excited about this? So I was looking in the book when I was planning these slides, and I think the next chapter was another data structure or something like that. And I'm like, you know what? At the end of this, we're going to actually write some code that does something cool. So we'll get to like real code using this stuff very, very shortly. There are tons of different ways to get data out of a dictionary. Um, we've already looked at this. Uh, square brackets for age for this key. So D is a dictionary with one key, age, and a value of 41. We can get the age value, and in the interactive terminal, it'll print out 41. The problem with this, if you try to access a key that doesn't exist, you get an error. So I have not set a key height for this dictionary, and when I try to access it using the square brackets, I get an error. I get a key error saying this key does not exist. It's very similar to a array index out of bounds kind of error if you try to get a, a uh, item out of a list by a index that doesn't exist. It's a way of saying this key doesn't exist. 
So a way to safely get a key out of a, or get the value of a key out of a dictionary um, is to use a get function on the dictionary. So you can see here we have d.get and in the parentheses, the parameter to that get function is a key. And the return value would be the uh, value of that key in the dictionary, just like if we did the, the square brackets. Now, the good thing here, if we do a get on a key that doesn't exist, the return value is, is none, the value none, capital N-O-N-E. Have we talked? We haven't talked about none yet, have we? Oh my goodness, I am the worst teacher ever. I'll do slides on that next time. But none is the same thing as null or nil or things like that in other programming languages. Um, it means there was no value associated with that key, and so you can't really do anything with it. So it's not a false, if it were a Boolean, it is, it is another thing um, that represents the lack of data. It's capital N-O-N-E. So you can still assign it to a variable. Oh, sorry, uh, I don't think I showed that here. Oh, I do in the next line. No, I don't. Anyway, so the first one, all of these, um, get functions, you can assign the return value to a variable. And so in this case, when I do d.getAge, uh, if I assign that to a variable, um, the value of that variable would be 41. Uh, when I assign d.getHeight to a variable, the value is none, there is no value. So that is a, a, a magic structure within, um, within Python. And Damien, I just saw the question in Slack. Uh, am I going to record? Yes, it is recording. I'm just not using the Zoom recording. So I'll, I'll upload it to YouTube after this. Um, another way to get, another way to interact with the um, dictionary is with the get function. There's a second optional parameter to provide a default value. So in this case, uh, d.getHeight as the key, comma 99. 99 is the default value, which means if there is no height attribute, or if there is no height key in my dictionary, return this default. So in the dictionary that I created above that just had age, it did not have a height. And so x, the variable I'm assigning the value from get to, is 99. It's the default value. This is equivalent to this syntax here, d.getHeight or another value. Um, we have seen or in comparisons, you know, if number is less than 21 and or or greater than 40, whatever. Um, you can also use or here where the, um, the way it works is the same thing. So starting left to right, d.getHeight, if the value from that it equates to true, meaning it's a, it's a non-empty list, or it's a Boolean that is true, or it's a, um, a dictionary with values in it, uh, then that will get returned. But if it's, a, if it's none, or it's a non-true uh, value, then it'll, it'll apply the, the next thing on the right. 99. And so that can be chained to if we wanted to, but you typically won't do that. So I, I understand, I've realized that these are two different ways of doing the same things, kind of. Um, any questions about it? Does it make sense? Can you see where you would do that? One quick question. So when you're using get, do you always use parentheses versus the brackets? Correct. In the first example? Yep. Yep. Exactly right. Okay. So okay. Th the brackets, you'll see there's no like dot the name of a function. It's just a direct access to that, that key. Okay. The, Thank you. Yep. Get is a function on the class of, of dictionary or of the data type dictionary. 
um, and the parameter. So the function call is is the is the parentheses, and the the key is a uh, parameter to that function. Great question. Um, this is not in the book, but it's something I think is really important to know how to do. Uh, we can chain things together using those default values to handle um, unknown data structures safely. And so after the code we're going to write later is going to deal with the, the Spotify APIs. Um, I'll talk about what all that is later, but there's, there's an API at Spotify to get information about an artist and their albums. And so uh, you can imagine if you think about attributes of an artist, you know, you have names and age and genre and other albums they've created, other artists they've collaborated with, like th these structures can be very, very large um, and they're kind of optional. So in the example of a other collaborated artists, you know, some artists may not collaborate with anyone ever. So there might be a missing attribute or a, a missing uh, value. And so if we look at a big structure, you know, I just took kind of part of it and I actually fudged it a little bit. But uh, imagine this is, this is J, a JSON structure, so JavaScript object notation. Um, it, it looks exactly like a Python dictionary because they're basically the same thing. It's a bunch of key value pairs. Um, the, so the return value from this API looks like this. You know, there's an href attribute. There is an album attribute and that album in this case has data underneath of it, um, which also includes an artist. Maybe there are other artists on this album. And so these structures can be uh, large and complex, but they're typically defined, especially when we talk about APIs um, from a company like Spotify. They're gonna define what that structure could look like, but half of these things could be optional. And so when we, when we write code, it's really hard to answer a question like, what is the name of the first artist associated with the, this artist's first album or the first collaborator on this artist's album? And so if we look at this structure, there's really no good way to say like, um, give me that structure. So uh, if we imagine that we have converted that JSON into a dictionary, and called it Spotify value. We can use that get function, passing in a key for album, trying to reference this. And that album, if it exists, has an artist. But if it doesn't exist, it might not, it won't have an artist. And maybe the artist doesn't exist. So we can do a default, kind of a, a chain of default values here, so we can simplify our code. So our Spotify value, we can get the album dictionary, but if it doesn't exist, I'm just gonna return an empty dictionary, which means I can then reliably call a get function on either the real album or the fake empty dictionary, trying to get the attribute artist. And doing the same thing, the artist might not actually exist. If it does, great, I'll return that dictionary Otherwise, I'll return a empty one. And then I can call the get name function on that second, third level of dictionary, and I'll get a return value. That might be a none return value, but this code will always run, whether those keys exist or not. That's the important part. Um, another way of writing that would be a whole bunch of nested if, if statements. So get the album, if the album exists, then get the artist, if the artist exists, get the name. So depending on your, your style of code, you might like the first one better, you might like the second one better. Um, it's, it's an option and that's, that's one thing I really like about chaining these default values together is, for me, this looks pretty easy to understand. And now I don't have to worry about like, What's the, the where, where is this variable accessible from? What is the scope of that variable? Anything, I don't have to worry about any of that. I don't have to set a default value if none of this works. I can just have a, a longer but chained list of get functions to get that, that final attribute. 
Which code do you think is easier to read? This is an open discussion. The first one, like in the comments. Yeah, the first one's easier for me to read too. I think so too, um, especially after doing this for so long, like my eyes just skip this stuff. Like I skip kind of the, the template stuff and I see album, artist, name. Okay, cool, so I understand that chain. Um, it, I mean, it's it's 601, half dozen of the other, but uh, I think personal style comes into it eventually. So a dictionary, just like, you know, when we talked about the list, there are a ton of functions available for this data type. Um, and and I'll, I'll run through the, the ones I picked out of the documentation that that I think we would use mostly there were and there was probably another dozen available functions but um, the the first one list returns a list of the keys so for our alien with the point value and the color um, if we call the list function on that dictionary we would get a list with two strings in it uh, one would be color and one would be point value or points length returns a number of items in the dictionary um, that came from the documentation. Um, I think more accurately, it's a, a list of the number of keys. And the reason I like it to say it that way is uh, it could be confusing if you're trying to count the number of values in your list, because if it's an array, do you count that as one or do you count the number in the array or list, it count the number of items in the list too. So it, it's a number of, of keys in the, the dictionary. You can test if a key is in the dictionary. So like in an if block, you can say if key in the dictionary, and it'll return true if it's in there, false if it's not. The inverse of that if it's not in the dictionary. Um, an iterator is a, a another data structure within um, Python and, and design patterns in general. Um, but there's an iter function to give you an iterator of the keys. Um, is clear removes everything copy copies the dictionary uh, items this is an important one uh, I'll show I think it's code on the next slide but uh, we'll come back to items but this is a, a way to iterate through the key and the value not just the key there's a keys function that returns a list of the keys which is very much like the list function um, and values, whoops, this is a typo. This returns a list of the values, not an actual list of the keys. I need to fix that. So values returns a list of the values. Um, and so the, the functions like list and keys and uh, items are important for when we want to loop on the dictionaries. So we talked about for loops at length before. Um, we can write for loops around dictionaries as well. And I have one, two, three different ways of, of doing that here. Um, the first is, so if I have this product variable, it is a dictionary with three keys inside of it, product ID, name, and price. I can do a for loop where I can the, the, I'm creating two variables. One is called key and one is called value, just for this for loop, in product.items. So that way I can get the key and its value immediately, um, and then I can do whatever I want. If I want to print it, if I wanted to show it on a website, whatever I wanted to do. That's a, a, a simple way of iterating all your keys and values. Um, another way is for key in product.keys. So remember, product.keys returns a list, and that list uh, we can then iterate like we, we did any other lists. I think last week we talked about lists an awful lot. Um, so we can then we can iterate the list by its key, but then we have to get the value of that key by either using the square brackets or by using the get function. In this case, when you are iterating the keys, your square brackets will never cause an error. 
you will never see that that um, key error that we saw before because the, the the for loop guarantees that that key is in there. So that's why I don't have a dot get function. Um, interestingly enough, though, the default value, like if I do a for loop on the dictionary itself, it loops the keys. So I don't really need to do this dot keys function in a um, for loop. Now, if I wanted to sort that loop, then I would do the keys function. So see, we're, we're, we're now building on top of the, the for loop construct, but using a different um, variable type as the thing that we are looping over. But the syntax is, is the same. So we can uh, also generate a unique list of values. So uh, given a dictionary in this example for favorite programming languages for, I don't know, students in the class or people of the poll that we're polling, um, we have a dictionary here. The key is the, everyone's first name and the value is their favorite programming language. So you can see Jen likes Python, Sarah likes C, Edward likes Ruby, and Phil likes Python. If I iterate over the values to print them out, I can make a list like this. This is a favorite prog programming language, Python, C, Ruby, Python. If I wanted to make a unique list, a very straightforward way of doing that is, is uh, creating a new data structure called a set. So a set is an unordered collection of distinct objects, distinct hashable objects. So the outcome, um, we are now for looping over the set. And so we can see we don't get any duplications. So set is another very common data structure in computing, um, and it always has the same definition of a, a unique list of unordered objects. So now we have lists, we have dictionaries, and we have sets. Um, sets have, have um, functions available to them very much like a list does. So I think pretty much every list, every function we can use on a list, we can use on a set as well. So we don't go too much into sets. All right, so the end of chapter three, there, or sorry, chapter six, there's a couple more examples. Um, I, I thought it was interesting how to put dictionaries in a list and how to put lists in a dictionary. So that was kind of interesting but it's, it's really straightforward. Um, if you wanna read through the examples and use cases they talk about, then feel free to. Uh, we are earlier than I thought, but does anyone want a five minute break? I see one face of a no. Nah. No. Cool. Okay. Good. Drew's good. All right. So, uh, good. Let's do some fun stuff. So this is not from the book, probably at all. Um, so we're going to kind of make this up as we go along, and I think it hopefully it'll be fun. Uh, but a couple of terms that we need to know ahead of time before we get into this example. Um, the slides will not cover most of this material. Well. It has these definitions, but the actual code we're going to write is not directly in the slides, but I will save it and I will link it to um, to the slides when we're done. So a couple things to know. Uh, has, is everyone familiar with the term API or web API, RESTful API, HTTP API, web service? Like in, anyone not familiar with those terms? Not sure what an API is. 
Cool. So I will explain. Um, an application programming interface is a generic term API. Uh, this can come in many forms, um, whether it is a system library on your Unix machine to open a file, that's an API. Uh, more commonly for uh, enterprise application development, we use the term API to represent a, a web service or a source of data or actions um, that is available to our code uh, over the network. So it's a typically a remote, another application running a service that our application will call. So if we think of our application as a client, the other application is the server. The server hosts some sort of service that we can access remotely. Um, typically, you will see things like uh, an API to list customers for a company. Um, that API will interact with the database to get the information, but our design patterns have us interacting with that via a network API call instead of connecting directly to the database. Lots and lots of reasons to do that. Um, but it's a, it's a network-based or over-the-network-based service of some sort that our application will inter interact with. Uh, HTTP is the protocol that we will be using to uh, call these APIs. Um, HTTP is, is fundamental to the World Wide Web. Um, it is what your web browser does all day long. Uh, it is a request and a response format. And so you've probably seen things like HTTP get, post, patch, delete, etc. Um, yes, affirm. Someone, maybe. Familiar with HTTP to some extent? Anyone there? Yes. Thank you, Corey. Got one yes. I'm more comfortable saying first names even though it's on a recording, so I won't say your last name. Okay, cool. So I got a couple of yes there. Um, one I do not expect any of you to know is OAuth or OAuth 2. Bonus points, figuratively, if you know what OAuth is. I'm going to take silence as a no. And an explicit no, thank you very much, is a no. So OAuth is an open authentication protocol. Uh, it is, if you've ever been to a website and it says log in using Facebook, have you seen that? Facebook, LinkedIn, Google, whatever, yes. Um, uh, it's everywhere, it's all over the place. Like my Strava application for tracking my, biking ride, my bike rides. Like I log into all of these services via Facebook. Um, the cool thing about OAuth is I don't ever have to give my authentica authentication credentials to the application. So Strava does not know what my Facebook authentication credentials are. Oh, I frozen. So I'll start over uh, for the OAuth stuff, kind of. Uh, OAuth is a uh, authentication protocol. I can log into a website like Strava uh, via Facebook without Strava ever knowing my Facebook credentials. And based on the protocol, they can trust that Facebook authenticated who I am, and then they can get information about me from Facebook. And that's how our identities get uh, shared, but without sharing credentials. So. With the before and the after, the hiccup, was that kind of enough to give you a general idea that this is some sort of cool authentication protocol? Good enough? Good enough. All right, cool. So Spotify. Um, Spotify is a music service. Probably listen to music through Spotify. One cool thing they have is a, a Spotify for developers. This is a list of services 
that they provide that I can embed into my applications. So some of the key things here are a client ID and a client secret. Secrets are truly secret. Um, this is how my application authenticates with Spotify to say my authentication is who I am. That's independent of you as a user authenticating with Spotify for my application and know who it is. But that's not, not terribly relevant at this point. Um, what we do is let's figure out how to use these APIs and we'll figure out something we can do. Da, 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 da. I'm going to searching. So searching, I wanna find things about artists and music and fun stuff like that. Uh, I can do all this without having, having an actual user uh, authenticate. So we can just kind of play with this API in our code. So I see that there are searching players. So we, let's, let's make a goal of calling this search endpoint. First thing I need to do, well, let's play with this. So I'm going to end up with that API as where I'm calling. So if we go to, I think most everybody is using Anaconda or has Anaconda installed. Um, I am going to use this now as a package manager or a, a dependency management tool for, for my application. So in my environments, I'm I already have one Spotify, but I'll make another one. I'll do a Spotify test two and oh, I'll create Spotify test two. And I want to use Python version 3.7. It might be a little small, I apologize. And I'm clicking Create. Best practices when you are doing Python development, always create a virtual environment for every application that you write. Each application gets its own virtual environment. So this one is creating. Anaconda is really slow when it does this. Oh, I see, because it's installing all these stupid dependencies. I mean, all these wonderful dependencies. Anaconda is primarily used for data science, machine learning, um, that kind of stuff. And so a lot of these default, um, default packages are kind of bulky. I'll give it another minute and see what happens. Um, otherwise, I'll skip over to an environment I have that's preset up. The glory of live demos. All right, let's pretend that worked. In the folder with the slides, I have a, a library already set up, or I have a, a virtual environment already set up. Here I'm using a different package manager called pip, um, but the, the functionality is the same. If I don't get Anaconda running a new environment tonight, I'll, um, I'll record a video sped up showing how to do that. But let's go in here. So I'm using this virtual environment and to make life easier, I have a run script. Is that big enough to read? Okay. Uh, in that run script, I'm. If, if you're familiar with environment variables, whether you're on Windows or Linux or, or a Mac, um, environment variables will, can hold data. And so in this environment file, I have my client secret and my client ID already set up. Um, so it won't go on the video. So, uh, you know, hackers from worlds that want to hack my fake Spotify account can't do it. Um, but then I have a Python or, or a, a Spotify file, uh, Python file that we will be using. So I'm going to open this in Visual Studio Code. And I'm going to do my darndest not to open that .env file. Let me make sure I get my right virtual environment. So there 
There we go. Virtual Ends Spotify X is easy. All right, so let's open my Spotify PY file. I hit play. And there we go, that's what I needed. But since Anaconda's running, this is running super slow too. There we go. Um, Spotify, that's the one. Okay, so I just picked my virtual environment within Visual Studio Code uh, so I can run what I expect to run. So I'm not doing anything in this code yet except configuring my logger and I'm setting two variables from my operating system access from the operating system uh, package which I didn't actually import yet because we haven't talked about that yet um, and there's a, a magic function on the OS package called environ to get access to those environment variables based on our conversation tonight can anyone guess what that os.environment data type is excuse me A dictionary? Hey, good job. It's probably a dictionary. Um, and so I'm accessing a key called client ID and assigning it to a variable. And I am accessing another key called client secret and, a, and assigning it to a variable. So um, I had to get access to this function on the OS package. We haven't really talked about modules and packages yet, but we will. Uh, but for me to run this OS dot stuff, I had to import the OS package. And so let's try to run this again. And oh, I have to save, run. It doesn't do anything yet. So we can, we can log our client ID that is acceptable. Logging debug client ID. Client IDs are acceptable to share. Client secrets are not acceptable to share. So when I run this, I should see that big old client secret FBBA going back to here. I'm confirming that this is my client secret. I'm jumping around quickly, I apologize. I'm just getting back to this page to say yes, that FBBA is my client ID and not my client secret. Cool, so um, I'm gonna dual screen this. That'll make life better. And you can go away. All right, this might be a little jammed up, but I'm gonna do my best. You can see that okay? Ish. All right, back to the API. So the API lives at this endpoint, search. So let's pretend we're gonna make a function called search and uh, somebody name their favorite uh, artist or song or something. Interaction. I don't know what that is, but we'll use it. I hope this won't be embarrassing for me. So to, I am making a function called search, and I'm going to use a variable named Q as the parameter. Q is always, basically always used as like the default search parameter. So we'll do that. Pass does nothing. This just means I have a function, or I, I have an actual function. Logging.debug searching for the queue. Running. I like to run my code every time I make any change just to see it still does what I expect it to do. So I see I am now debugging my search parameter. If I did it again, everybody likes Beyonce, right? I don't know much, anyway. I'll see I call that function twice and I see that output twice. Okay, cool. 
So let's look at this URI, this uh, API. I have a URL or a URI for it. I will set that to a variable. The value is a string for API Spotify v1 dot search or v1 search. And there's a parameter Q is the oh, Q and type are required. So I know that I can pass my query parameters as, or I can start with a dictionary. So I'll start my parameters as a dictionary. I'm going to be explicit here. And I will set Q, oops. I'm having typing issues, I apologize. And what's the other one? Type? I don't know what this is. So let's see. Type is required. Uh, a comma separated list of item types to search across. Valid types are album, artists, playlist, track, show, episode. All right, so let's do album to start, album and artist. So our search will be searching albums and artists. Uh, markets, limits, offsets, include. Okay, cool. So I'm going to kind of ignore those and just look at these required variables. Let's debug this. And I think I can do this string of my parameters. Maybe? Nope, it didn't like that. Oh yeah, it did. Not all arguments. Oh, it's a percent %s, I think. There we go. So now I'm, I'm, I know my dictionary of parameters has two keys and two values. The first one's Brahana and the type of album artist. Now comes the fun part. There is a library available to Python. It's a third party library, so it's not part of the uh, Python standard development called requests. Requests is a library to make HTTP requests. So the format is requests.get because I look at my API and I see get. The first parameter is the URL. And I know the second one, I think it's params. I'm going to assign my dictionary. I know it also has a return or a result that I can inspect. And just for fun, we will print out the result. So this is my setup. I'm defining the URL, my parameters, and I'm going to use the requests library get function to make that HTTP request. And I'm going to hit play. And it's not going to work. So requests is not defined. So much like the OS at the bottom, I need to import the requests module or library and now we'll see what happens I hit play again and it says no module named requests anyone want to guess why there's no module named requests I haven't installed it yet so if I were in Anaconda, let's see, did it work? Oh, I think it worked. If you're using Anaconda, this is how you install a third-party library. So in my Environments tab on the left, I pick the environment that I'm in. So here I'm picking Spotify Test 2. I'm looking for not installed packages. And you can see there's a gigantic list. 
Python, the Python community of developers basically has a standard way of sharing their modules. And so this looks against that list. So I'm just typing in requests and I look down here, Python HTTP for humans is a description of the requests library. So I'm gonna check that and then I'm hitting this apply button in the lower right hand corner. Uh, if you're watching the YouTube video later, it's behind my head. So I'm hitting apply and it's saying the following packages will be modified. It looks for dependencies and it, 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 I'm telling it just to install requests, but it will install any dependency that the requests library also has. And eventually that will work. Since I'm in a hurry, I can look at my my application, and like I said, I was using I'm using pip, or pip env. Pip is the the package management, env is an easier way to use it. Pip env install requests. It does a whole bunch of stuff, resolves the dependencies, keeps track of what it's installing. And now it's done. Let's see which one was faster. Oh, see it was faster. Okay, so I in, now I have installed the requests library. We'll cover that in detail, but for now, um, I just wanna get this running so we can show some cool code. And I'm gonna hit play again. And now I'm gonna go step by step. Client ID, query, parameters, starting new HTTPS connection to apispotify.com. See, now we're actually doing something, yay! We're actually doing something on the internet. Um, it's making a request to this URL, v1 search, as we specified up here, with the parameters q equals brana and type equals the comma separated list but I got an HTTP response code of 401. Anyone know what an HTTP response code of 401 means? It's not one you would see often. 404 means not found, good guess. You're in the right, in the right area, unauthorized. Yes, exactly. HTTP 401 means it is unauthorized, which means we didn't authenticate. We didn't tell the Spotify API who we are. So how do we do that? I casually had skipped over the header parameter for authorization, because this is where we start getting into OAuth. They have an o their own guide for that. So let's open this OAuth guide. We are doing app authorization we are not doing user authentication or user authorization. Authentication means I can prove who I am. Authorization means I'm allowed to do what I want to do. All right. Um, and so all this being said, I'm going to go to my client Called, this is OAuth magic client credentials. I'm going to give them my client secret and my client ID, and I'm going to get an access token. So we have to do that first. The magic, or the, the, the important part is a access token. So I'm gonna make a new function called get access token. And so I have another URL I need to make an HTTP request to. API slash token. And this one's going to be an HTTP post. The request body parameters are grant type. So I'm going to need body parameters, parameters as a dictionary. and it's saying it is required and I need to set it to client credentials. All right, cool. 
Alright, uh, then I need a header value. So headers again, I'm going to use a dictionary. Headers um, has an authorization header is the base 64 encoded string that contains a client ID and a client secret. The field must have the format authorization colon basic base 64 encoded, etc. All right, let's figure this one out. So if everybody kind of loosely following where I'm going. All right. Basic then I know I'm going to need some encoded string. Let's make that encoded string. Uh, base64 encoded. So I know there's a Base64 library. This is the beauty about Python. Every, there's a library for everything. Base64. This is a native part of the Python environment. So uh, best practices or, or standard gu style guide standards First, I import all the things in Python. After that, I import the um, third-party libraries. And technically, I'm supposed to alphabetize them, I think. All right, so let's see if we can figure out base64. Base64 dot base64 encode. I think it takes a string. So we'll do a formatted string of client ID colon client secret. Client ID colon client secret. Okay. So what one thing I'm trying to show is that um, documentation, while it might be kind of hard to read, if it's done right, it tells you exactly what to do. So now let's make this HTTP request. So I know I'm going to have a response. Requests.post to my URL, which is above. Headers is an optional parameter. I'll pass in my headers. And my body parameters, I believe they like JSON. And so I know I want to pass in a JSON body with my body parameters. Let's see if that works. Um, logging, debug, string version of the response. So I'm not pulling out the value yet, but I will. I'm going to hit play. Um, here, oh. I need to call that function first, huh? So just for, for giggles, I know I'm going to return my token. We'll make it blank for now. Whoops. I'll return that token. And before I do my search, I know I'm going to need that token. So access token equals get access token see I'm chaining my my function calls so now that that get access token function will actually be called I'll hit play uh, bytes like object is required not string and now I need to go to some Python documentation real quick Python base 64. Base 64, encode, bytes like object. Oh, I know what I have to do. Let's see if there's an example. Base 64, encode. Oh, put a B in front of my string? That might be that easy. Oh, it's a formatted string. I don't know if I can do that. So we'll do. B. Format, client ID, client secret. Maybe that'll work. Eh, go away. Byte objects has no... That might work. 
Now I'm just guessing. And then another one. String argument without an encoding. Fine, I'll read examples. Python base 64 encode a string. I think I'm going to have to use the encode. I'm scrolling quickly so I can find. Okay, that's what I thought. So. Let's make my secret client equal the go back to that formatted string client ID client secret. Okay, now I have a string object. Sorry, that was a little dense. Um, I'm making a string object like this message variable on the right. We'll make a message bytes after that, but I'm encoding my client secret. ASCII is fine. And then I want to base64 encode that message bytes as my encoded string, which is then going to go in my basic authentic my, my basic authorization header. All right, I think we're good now. I hit run. Body parameters was not defined because I typoed it. All right, we're getting somewhere. So, we just want to add an order. Access token. It should be 415 on my token post. Grant type. Client credentials. Oh, it doesn't want JSON. It wants form encoded. I promise this will be really fun in a minute. Typically, you want to send some form encoded data, which is data, not JSON. Spots four hundred. No, I'm not entirely sure why this is happening. I got my authorization header. My grant type client credentials. HTTPS account Spotify tokens. So let's see, there should be some text in here too. Invalid client. Let's see. Client ID colon client secret.
Okay, so it's definitely a value. Hmm. Where did the dashboard go? Well, now I'm frustrated. So you're getting a glimpse of what it looks like to be a developer. It's not always fun. Secret client, secret client. String, basic encoded string. I'm sure I'm doing something very stupid. But I'm gonna cheat. When was the last time I taught this class? Eh. This was in class. This was. There, here, here we go. So, the last time I taught this class, it was C. And so we can look at like what it looks like to write this in C, and it's awful. Combined bytes, UTF 8, encode, decode, basic encoded, grant type, client credentials data, headers. See, the code is very, very similar. Uh, but this one I will do differently. Base64 bytes secret client UTF-8 UTF-8. That's combined. Key secret. Key secret. Base64 Encode bytes that. Oh. That's my encoded. I think I'm on to something. Hey, it worked. All right, come back to me. Everybody still there? I'm here. <laughs> All right, cool. Now you can see, finally, and I really apologize for that. Uh, it's always something stupid. Should have done it beforehand. Um, I got an HTTP 200 response. Everybody know what 200 is and why I got so excited when I saw it? It's a success. It means, yay, everything's good. So HTTP 200, and as a result, I got a big old JSON structure. What does that JSON structure look like? It looks an awful lot like a dictionary. Dot get. access token so now I have an access token goodness now how do I use that access token that's the fun question uh, authorization oh it's still over there so now I got that 
Oh, use it. Authorization code, access token, and a refresh token. Access token. Good. Client ID. Good. I did all that. Grant type. Here we go. No, that's not right. Okay, search. Okay, authorization. Obtaining authorization. Authorization. I just need it to tell me how to use it. There we go. Okay. Now I need to add an authorization header to my search. So back in my search function, I'm going to add an authorization header. And the value is going to be a formatted string bearer. I'm following this bearer space the token space the access token. Now if this works, I should instead of seeing an HTTP 401, I should see an HTTP 200. But I didn't pass my headers. Headers, 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 headers. Okay, cool. So another optional parameter, headers here again. The value of that headers, headers, header, what was it? Headers. Save. I forgot to hit save. I don't see any 401s. I see a 200 response. So let's see what the response looks like. Does that look familiar? Kind of the thing I looked at in class when I was chaining my, my uh, dictionary get things together. So we've made an API call to the, the Spotify API to search to find information about this artist. Available markets, uh, all of them maybe. Let's see if we see anything about albums. There's some images. Let's see if we can find some, if this works. Live demo risk, I have no idea what this image is going to be. Does that look like what we expected? Maybe. Looks good to me. What else do we have in here? Oh, we have albums. One album, all the markets, Spotify. Looks like we can use this URL to find it and listen to that album, maybe. Risky. If there's foul language, I apologize. I know nothing about this artist. I'm not going to actually let it play. And then it should have another search down near the bottom for Beyonce as well, because I did that. The Lion King. That might be Beyonce. I don't know. So you can see we have now interacted with that backend server. And besides all of my headaches of getting my syntax right, it really wasn't that bad. I mean, we're only at 47 lines of code. I 
I think it took me 300 lines of C, C++ code just to do the authorization step. And so that is uh, going to be kind of the foundation of projects we might work on this semester. Whether we're building our own API or calling external APIs, we're going to figure that out. But for now, um, I think the important things we talked about were the, the modules, like the third-party modules, the built-in modules for Base64 encoding. Um, there is some voodoo within Python when it comes to strings and Unicode and bytes and whatever all the differences are. And uh, we're going to have to work through that together because I wouldn't say I have a super strong understanding of it. But I obviously got it to work at one point in time, so we could do it again. And so this um, pattern of, of building the code, I tried to just kind of take it step by step, following the documentation for this API I wanted to consume. Later in the semester, uh, we're going to be looking at data analysis. Yes, I think it was an album cover. Um, we're going to be doing data analysis. And there are, as an example, um, government provided data sets. I think it's data.gov or, data or something like that. Where, uh, yeah, this is it. So we can get all kinds of cool data. They have 225,000 data sets. Department of Agriculture. I'm kind of just drilling through to pick stuff. Um, there's So when we see things like resolvedata.json URL, this is effectively an API where we can call and get a list of data sources. Um, kind of USDA Open Data Catalog, XML, JSON version. So looking through here, uh, I'm trying to see if there's anything that sticks out as being cool. This data set is a listing of Secretary of Agriculture's public schedule. Could be interesting. Um, federal IT cost savings. So if we look at cost savings and avoidance data sets, these should start sounding like things that could be something you might do in a business environment. If we pull this kind of a data set, I have a feeling there's an awful lot of data in there. And so that's where the data analysis part of this class we're going to first foundationally have to pull this data down. Second, we're going to analyze that data using different tools once we get the foundations of the language done. So I'm super excited. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. And uh, yeah, that's kind of it. No homework assignments tonight. I won't give you a quiz on Thursday next week. Will I? I've only given you one. I might give you a quiz Thursday next week. It will not be about like the requests library or anything like that. If I do, it will only be about dictionaries. Um, so that, yeah, assume there will be a quiz. See how I work through this on the fly? There will be a quiz about dictionaries. Um, I'm going to, well, before I rant on more and more, does anyone have any questions about what we just did? Does anyone have a doubt that I know what I'm talking about because of how much I just fumbled over that? Cool. All right, I'm going to hit my stop recording.